Um, hi, hello, good afternoon, uh, good evening, night, whatever. Hi. Evening. Evening. Good. Welcome to uh, the Poet in Residence reading series here at the University of Dubuque. My name is Lauren Elaine, and I am the Poet in Residence here. I'm also an English department member, or actually we've changed our title to the Department of Language and Liter Languages and Literatures, um, which is important as I uh, introduce our, our reader tonight. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about the reading series. I want to tell you who's responsible so you can like thank them, hopefully. Um, and for, f for starters, the um, Academic Affairs for giving us the, the sponsorship to do that. Tonight in particular, I need to thank the English Honors Society, Sigma Tau Delta, our campus chapter, for providing the lovely refreshments. You're welcome to share afterward. Um, and about the reading series, again, this is something we do two or three times a semester um, where contemporary writers, poets, fiction writers, nonfiction writers um, come and just read their work. They're open to your questions. It's a really great opportunity. We've had some stellar readers come by, Roxane Gay, Patricia Smith, David Mira, um, people whose names might not mean anything to you until you've come and heard them and then you're fans forever. Um, so please take advantage of the opportunity. Come uh, hear writers read. It's different to experience literature um, on the pages as opposed to embodied in life where you can hear the voice of the poet, you know, the tone of the poem, all of those words that, you know, you use in literary analysis and in class really take on a different tenor um, when the person is standing in front of you. Those questions you can't ask the author, you can hear. <laughs> so please, please, please um, take advantage. And just a heads up, this is the last one for this semester, but um, in the spring, I'll have Tim Bascom coming here in March. I think it's the eighth, and Allison Joseph and John Tribble. Um, I call them the dynamic duo of literature. They are both publishers and poets, and they'll be coming in April. Um, so good things coming ahead to the spring. But for tonight, we have an extra, extra special treat. Um, Dr. Janine Peters is the English department's most recent hire, and dare I say, proof of our very excellent taste. <laughs> she is our global literature specialist, and she'll also be directing the Spanish program here at UD, which is why, again, because we're not just doing English language anymore, we're also trying to get our Spanish minor and our Spanish program really going. It's, we're now the Department of Languages and Literatures. Um, she came to the University of Dubuque after seven years in Toronto, Canada. Um, so the cold is not going to drive her away. <laughs> and she completed her MFA and PhD at the University of Toronto Center for Comparative Literature. She's the author of two poetry chapbooks, um, Our Lady of the Snow Angels from back in 2012, and A Place to Go, which is hot off the press. It was released in November, the end of November, the 25th, I think, um, pu published by Lyrical Miracle Press in Toronto. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar to the term, a chapbook is like a baby poetry book. Um, and so it's, you know, it's a little bit smaller. And her first full-length collection of poetry is due from Quattro Books in next fall. So we are celebrating tonight the release of one book and looking forward to the one that comes next fall. Janine has been writing poetry ever since the second grade. Favorite poets include William Blake, St. John of the Cross, Simborska, Neruda, Mary Oliver, all these fantastic people I totally approve of, so. <laughs> good, she's good. Um, and I just to tell you a little bit about what you're about to hear. Um, Janine's work, I think, as good poetry should, really invites us to engage fully in our humanity, in the mystery, the confusion, and the wonderment of it. And of course, being engaged isn't easy. We know that. We're humans. And being good humans and good people makes demands of us. And Janine's poetry looks to faith, looks to the natural world, and looks to our own sometimes flawed, sometimes glorious human heart for direction. My favorite poem of hers, well, my favorite poem to date, when she's, and she knows this and she's probably a little sick of it, but um, she, write, she has a poem called Gray Wingless Angels that recalls an encounter with a homeless man and the speaker's range of emotions as she chooses to engage with him, to tend to him. The poem reminds us, and this is a quote, the love you have is the love you give. There isn't any more. What a challenge. What an inspiration. So on that note, let's show our new campus family member and reader, <laughs> Dr. Janine Peters, some love and applaud her. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Lauren. That was such a generous introduction. And thank you for having me here. It's wonderful to be here reading for all of you. And thank you very much for coming. I know for some of you, it's a requirement. So I'll thank the teachers for who, who required you to be here, maybe. Um, OK, so I'll begin with a few pieces from my first chapbook. This is a piece that has kind of become my signature piece. I've done it too many times, but you've never heard it. So this is the first time and the last time you'll hear it. When we were human, when we lived in houses like books, lining the shelves of Borges Library, when each of our stories was a hagiography in the Encyclopedia of Saints, when we sat around kitchen tables sipping tea, words floating from our lips like butterflies bearing enormous scrolls, when we unraveled that parchment and still understood the strange cursive letters moving and flowing like worms beneath the earth. When we stuck our heads out the slow train's windows, beneath us, the rails were singing. When we got lost in a forest of conifers, when we made a wrong turn and ended up in the next town, when we took pictures of wasps, for they too were made of light when we watched the rain falling gently on mushrooms, when we stepped over wet stones in the dark forest, when we searched for stars in the mist, when the hum of mosquitoes was still the holiest prayer, when the veins of our hands were still roots and flowers sprouted from them as we grew old. Now, now we are told all movement is rotation. Now we are as motionless as stars. Now we search for ammonite fossils in the marble floors of shopping malls, reaching to touch the galaxy's spiral, but only feeling cracks. Now we neither kneel on pebbles at the river's edge, nor stare down at it from high crags. Now we would never stop to stroke the scales of a forest snake. Now we don't stand up to pray the Angelus at noon, and our voices no longer touch each other like folded hands. Now all our languages have converged into one single word, which we repeat again and again. We are told we have not changed. We are told we are as we always were. If anything, we are greater now, closer to those angels we once prayed to. We are told we should be grateful as we drift from now to now. We are told that we are still human, but I don't believe it. This one's called Rosary. You can tell by these that I'm from a Catholic background. Those whom I've hurt, I'd like to say I could count them on one hand, but instead they seem as numerous as all the perfect leaves I've admired and crumpled, all the marigolds I've ripped from their soil, the student caught drawing during my lecture, the rainbow I tore from her hand, the lovers to whom I whispered forever, though my caresses were just for now. My mother, her face a mask I briefly wore, then discarded. Those who've hurt me, these seem as numerous as the hairs on my head, but really they fit in one palm, one or two false friends, unfaithful loves, the occasional schoolyard bully, now, all these people are out of my view, blocked by canyons carved from years without communication. And yet, there are nights when I ascend to the wires and walk with arms outstretched among the sparrows. I see them, 
gold stars scattered over the map I've made, each of them the capital of her own mournful country. I descend from my tightrope and go off to find them, gather them up in my hands, each one a sorrowful mystery. I'm slowly stringing together, bead after bead. So, um, more cheerful one. This one is kind of inspired by, I don't know if anyone here has ever seen the Nutcracker Ballet by Tchaikovsky, where all the toys come to life. So this is called The Dolls. At 12, I was still a blonde Polish doll with a crown of flowers and ribbons, a white lace apron, crimson beads, and a vest embroidered with jewels. All day long, I stood on the mantel next to the Inuit woman in fur, the Victorian in her burgundy gown, a geisha in her shining kimono. Not one of us dared to move, and the hours rolled by like the heaviest stones. But then, at last, the moment arrived when the crystals cast rainbows over the walls and sunset bathed the room in gold. Night fell, and down we climbed to take our places on the floor. On our left, the brown velvet turtle awakened. On our right, the bears, bride and groom, sat down to their cups of perpetual tea. Then a paper mache owl arrived, bearing a gold violin. And at his first note, we all became human. We even received human names the geisha Yukiji, the Victorian Sarah, the newlywed bears Jane and John, while I, of course, was Janina. And all night long, in rounds and rows, we whirled like marbles, like snowflakes, like stars. But then, one night, my parents appeared. They put my companions back in their places and ordered me to bed. The following day, I was back on the shelf, the owl was banished forever. From that night forward, the lamps remained lit. The hours rolled on like boulders. So I don't know if Lauren Elaine mentioned this, but I also do Spanish-English translation. And wherever I go, I have to give a little plug for our Spanish minor here at UD. So if you are in your still beginning years and would be interested, we do offer a wonderful Spanish minor here. It's pretty simple in terms of its requirements. And I'd also recommend just taking a Spanish class because all of you, I, pr I promise you, if you're living in the United States, will be using Spanish. And if you're living elsewhere, chances are you'll be using it as well at some point. It's a major language of the world. So I'm going to read some poems that I translated by an Uruguayan poet called Marosa Di Giorgio. I don't think her picture will show up too well from here. But she's an amazing writer who lived from 1932 to 2004. And she's a major inspiration to me. She really draws a lot on nature and kind of the sublime and spirituality and surrealism and scary, weird stuff. She's very interesting. So I'll read a little of her for you. And um, I'll read both Spanish and English. Me acuerdo del atardecer y de tu alcoba abierta ya, por donde ya penetraban los vecinos y los ángeles, y las nubes de las tardes de noviembre que giraban por el suelo, que rodaban los arbolitos cargados de jazmines, de palomas y gotas de agua, aquel repiqueteo, aquel gorjeo en el atardecer. Y la mañana siguiente, con angelillas muertas por todos lados, parecidas a pájaros de papel, a bellísimas cáscaras de huevo, tu deslumbrador fallecimiento. I remember nightfall, and your room's open door, the door through which neighbors and angels came in, and the clouds, November evening clouds, drifting in circles over the land, the little trees burdened with jasmine, with doves and droplets of water, that joyous peeling, endless chirping, 
every evening the same. And the next morning, with its tiny dead angels strewn everywhere like paper birds, or the most exquisite of eggshells, your dazzling death. A veces en el verano, llueve solo un poco, debajo de los árboles. Entonces aparecen los grandes caracoles que avanzan siempre como si estuvieran inmóviles, pero avanzan siempre, estiran el cuello, todo lo miran y, y escudriñan. A veces se retraen tanto, se vuelven tanto sobre sí mismos que ya parecen yoyos de nácar, tomates de cristal. Ese ejército espumoso me da miedo y alegría. Y mamá allí, que inmóvil vigila con sus largas alas, sus egrets. Sometimes in summer, it rains just a little under the trees. Then the great snails appear, always advancing as if immobile, yet advancing just the same, sticking their heads out, scrutinizing everything. Sometimes they retreat so much, withdraw so much inside themselves, that they look like pearly yo-yos, crystal tomatoes. This foamy army brings me fear and joy, and mother there, motionless, watches with her long wings. Anoche vi otra vez la cómoda, la más antigua, la de las bodas de mi abuela y la juventud de mi madre y de sus hermanas, la de mi niñez, Allí estaba, con su alto espejo, sus canastas de rosas de papel. Y vino la periquilla blanca, casi una paloma, desde los árboles a comer arroz en mis manos. La sentí tan bien que iba a besarla. Pero entonces, todo llameó y se fue. Dios tiene sus cosas bien guardadas. Last night, again, I saw the chest of drawers, the oldest, from my grandmother's wedding, my mother and her sister's youth, my childhood. There it stood with its high mirror, its baskets of paper roses. And then the white chick, almost a dove, flew from the trees to eat rice from my hands. She felt so real to me that I was going to kiss her. But then, everything burst into flames and disappeared. God stows his things away safely. So do we have any criminal justice students here? Hands up if you're studying that area. So the next poet I'm about to read for you was a criminal lawyer. And I mean, that's the thing about poets. Like, none of them make their living off of writing poetry. Many are teachers. <laughs> Um, this one, Marosa Di Giorgio, she spent her whole life really doing a very bureaucratic job in her local city government, but it was a good position because it let her retire modestly after 20 years, so she was able to retire young and devote her time to writing. But this author I'm about to read is very interesting, a contemporary, also from Uruguay in South America. And both of these writers lived through the military dictatorship that was in control in that country in the late 70s and early 80s. So I don't know how much you know about Latin America, but it has a very rough history from the conquest, the Spanish conquest, to the present, really. And <clears throat> every country there is different. And Uruguay has a very long democratic tradition but it had this rupture, this period of dictatorship in the late 70s and 80s. And this particular writer, whose work I'm about to read, she actually spoke up against, against the dictatorship, and she was a professor of sociology at the university, and she lost her position because of it. So she really paid a price for speaking for what she believed and speaking against injustice. So her poems are really kind of tough and have a lot of punch to them, and I'll just read two of them for you. Abrázame. Este es el no lugar donde yo vivo y muero. Abrázame. 
tú que de seguro estarás escrito en el libro de la vida. Los hombres seguirán haciendo la guerra a los hombres. El mundo no será más. Abrázame. Te enterrarán lejos de mí. Me moriré lejos de ti. Después de tanta masacre, creo que esto es más infierno y más paraíso que el infierno y el paraíso, que no es necesario morir para encontra encontrarlos. This is the no place where I live and die. Hold me, you who will surely be written in the book of life. Man will keep waging war against man. The world will be no more. Hold me. They will bury you far from me. I will die far from you. After so much bloodshed, I believe this is a greater hell and heaven than hell and heaven themselves. We need not die to find them. Cristo es un hombre torturado. De la, torturo, de la tortura y de los hombres nace sangrante. Estamos acostumbrados a verle así colgado. Estamos acostumbrados. Esta tortura me enamora. Hoy me duele el mundo. Siempre me duele el mundo. El fuego de las mañanas. Estar viva. Veo hombres, banderas, ríos que se desgajan, soles. Muertos matarán a los muertos. Arrastrarán ventanas, escaleras. Féretros hurgarán ur los intestinos de los hombres. Y las uñas despavoridas desapare desaparecerán. Y la tierra no será más. Cristo es un hombre torturado que cae al aire puro fuera de las fronteras y las cárceles. Christ is a tortured man. He is born from the torture of men, bleeding. We are used to seeing him hanging like that. This torture steals my heart. Today the world hurts me. It always hurts me. The fire, the mornings, to be alive. I see men, flags, Rivers splitting apart, suns. The dead will kill the dead. They will drag behind them windows, stairs. Coffins will dig into men's intestines, and terrified fingernails will vanish. The world will be no more. Christ is a tortured man who collapses into pure air beyond borders and prisons. So yeah, you notice I like, I like pretty heavy stuff. Um, so my own book here, this chapbook, just came out last week from Lyrical Miracle Press in Toronto. And it's about the very cheerful and lighthearted topic of death and dying, which, you know, is something that I think we all have to face up to eventually and none of us really know how to. And I chose this topic, I chose to bring together a bunch of poems on this topic simply because I had quite a few deaths in my family and among my group of friends, um, extended family within, within the last year. So I have a few from here that I'll, that I'll read you. Um, I write a lot about my family. They provide me a constant source of material. So this one is for them, it's called What They Gave. My grandmother gave me a metal pig from Poland. One ear broke off when I dropped her. My Aunt Susan gave me savings bonds stored in our pantry, where she fixed herself Bloody Mary's furtive at every family dinner. She always said she'd never grow old, then died at 45. My Uncle John gave me a teddy bear once I became a flower girl for his third wedding. I kept it long after the divorce. He doesn't remember giving me a stuffed bear. My father gave me the gold clock that woke him each morning for 40 years. He dragged himself to the steel plant, kept on setting it long after it stopped running. 
For years, I kept these gifts on my dresser. Later, I packed them in suitcase after suitcase. Then I returned them to my childhood home, buried the clock in the old chest of drawers, put the unused bonds back in the safe. Today, when I go back and find that bear lying on its side in the corner, the pig next to the jewelry box, I still can't decide what I'm going to keep. I still don't know what I'm going to give. All right, so let's see. This one's, this one's, these are all so heavy duty. Oh, man, man I don't know what to read. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so here. Yeah, why not? Why not keep it heavy duty for a moment? Then I'll try to, I'll try to lighten it up a little. Um, okay, so this is, if you, if you read the, the news or watch the news, you probably know about illegal migration and legal migration into the U.S. and just so many people desperate fleeing very violent situations. So in El Salvador and Honduras, there are more violent deaths per capita than there are in countries in active war. And so many of these poor children are traveling unaccompanied. It's a really desperate situation. So I wrote a poem in response to that. It's called Diamond. And it has an epigraph from a poet called Jack Spicer. So the heart breaks into small shadows, almost so random they are meaningless, like a diamond has at the center of it a diamond, or a rock, rock. I am told that between cardboard walls, under a corrugated sheet metal roof, a 12-year-old boy stands, faces his parents. You are the hope of our family, they say. You can be watery muck or a diamond, take your pick. In the far corner of a shack, over piles of plastic bags, his uncle cuts him into a gem. The desert rolls him toward a glittering mirage, a vast coffee shop beyond the swarrows. Migrants parceled from behind a truck, there appears a dirt-scratched bumper sticker, the faded pink halo, a once bright blue angel-covered robe, La Morena, Virgin of Guadalupe. She is the silent prayer of his fear. There's no rescue for a diamond's sharp edge. No water pours into his sun-parched pain. Like David Foster Wallace's fish, who doesn't know what water is, I squint at my computer screen. Reports of scaled metallic ghosts, today's Knights Templar, 43 missing students, one string of beads among thousands and thousands of lost human jewels. Diamonds may not need water, but this boy does. He runs on to the cold north, where girls like me wear boys like him, diamond rings. One more heavy duty one and then I'll get more cheerful, I promise. Um, so this one's actually dedicated to Lauren. Um, it's in imitation of a poem that she wrote, kind of involving her older self looking back and speaking to her younger self. And it has the same title of two of her poems, actually. It's called 18. And it's dedicated to Lauren and also to my two college, college roommates from my freshman year of college. On September 11th, 2001, you're a college freshman lying in a dorm room 16 miles from the burning. The summer day is too lovely, the sky a frightening chemical blue. Somehow your mother's call reaches you. A plane just hit the World Trade Center. There's going to be a war. You put the phone down. You don't understand. A few weeks later, you join thousands in a march on Washington. War is not the answer, you cry. Of course, the war happens anyway. Everyone watches it on their TV screens. You give up church and take up walking, Grand Central to Times Square, down Broadway through twisting villages. You work as a gopher for an art dealer on the Upper East Side. When she sends you on errands, you stay at ground level. 
Rain chill slashes Madison Avenue as you step among suited men, darting to avoid the spokes of umbrellas that mark out personal space. Keep out, they hiss. You are not yet part of this world. You shiver and fall to your knees on the concrete, praying for the 30-year-old you, whoever, wherever she is, to come and put her arms around you like a big sister, to lean close and say, it's okay, it's okay. You're going to live a while yet, and many more bad things will happen, but you won't always skim the surfaces of streets. There will be more protests and petitions, elections and books. There will be homeless Christs whose faces you wipe, friends who offer their couches to you. You will live in a city much like this one, only closer, quicker to let you in. At night, you will see its tower beaming at you, a flame of love saying, yes, it's all right, you belong. It's temporary, of course. Like all towers, it will fall. We live on a butterfly's wing, a spider's web, an autumn leaf the sun holds up and admires briefly before crumpling. But if you are here, it means you belong. Don't be afraid to immerse yourself in the rain, to offer your light, to meet the suited men's gaze. Okay. Um, all right, I'll read two more from this and then one more from something else and that'll be it. So here, this one is called Foundation and then, um, yeah, so foundation. I remember when heaven was a physical place above the kitchen ceiling. Sometimes God spoke through the light fixture. Fear not, go out and play. We're sending some extra light just for you today. Those were the days when thunder was made by angels bowling balls, when summer rainstorms were Mary and Joseph watering us with garden hoses. I remember the annual wakes for some ancient relative. I knew that at night, when all had left, the coffin would be opened, the body would stand and walk away. Today, I step into an empty church. Is it really filled with the spirits of the brewers and steelworkers who built it? I dig my nails into the back of the pew before me. I struggle to see I'm touching the same atoms that mix and form stained glass, a white cloth on the altar, the paschal candle burning in silence. And the last one I'll read is the title of this book, A Place to Go, and it's dedicated to a dear family friend called Sandra Stotes, who passed away of cancer almost a year ago. Do they sing around a campfire or dance with brilliant streamers flowing from their wrists? Do they hold endless banquets with feasts of light? Perhaps they love as we do, minus the heartbreak. I don't know, but I trust them. And as more people I've loved set off on the journey, I yearn to join them. It's not that growing up makes life lose its luster, just that those lusters belong to the people we laugh and eat with, the ones who tell us stories when we are children, who promise us one day we'll see another world. But now that place is close, calling, ordering them to say goodbye. It's a dance. Why do I fear it? People hold back and cling to the concrete slabs they've built. Why do they tremble in sweaters and wet shoes? A chain of light climbs the mountain. I am told not to be afraid. After years of hedging my bets, I find the metal begins to pull me. This is not an end, but a crossroads. The deserted path we must climb leads to fields of sun. And the last one that I will read is not in any book yet, but hopefully next year at this time, I'll be holding my first full length collection in my hands. And this poem will be in there. It's called Gray Wingless Angels at Lauren's request. People fly in and out of our lives. I hold them if I can. Is it wrong to yearn for intimacies that don't swing? 
Who will turn around and say it? You are not alone in this world. When a wild-haired shoeless man shows up at the door, should I really send him away barefoot? I gave him your flip-flops. Hope you don't mind. No, this is not altruism. It's hearing my possible, not improbable future knocking at my door, seeing it glare into my eyes with a smile. He's 72, my mother's age. No wife, no children, no bed. He's a leaf who fell from November maples and hit bottom. He asks for a glass of milk. I pour it. I offer him English muffins with honey. My mouth is like a baby's, he declares, relishing the joy of no more teeth. The love you have is the love you give. There isn't any more. He wraps his scarf around his neck, back to face November wind. What would you do if you had no keys at all? If cafe owners shooed you away, if librarians tapped you on the shoulder and told you it was time to go. We'd like to rise above it, fly out in invention and freshness. But what if your pockets were filled with stones, heavy chunks of granite that stuck to the cloth and couldn't be disposed of? His odor lingers in the living room. The air may have memory, but it doesn't reward us. The reward is the struggle itself these gray wingless angels it sends to our door. Thank you very much. So I think Janine will be happy to take some questions, uh, poetry class people or anybody else. Anybody. Yes, please feel free to ask some questions. Any, you can ask me anything. No, I'm not. What inspired me to speak Spanish? So I started learning it in school, you know, high school, like so many people do. And a lot of people, for some reason I couldn't understand, didn't like learning Spanish. I loved it. And I continued in university. Um, and then I had the opportunity to continue learning after university. I actually got a grant through the US State Department, the Fulbright grant, which all of you UD students should look into. It's a wonderful opportunity to go abroad and do a project of your own designing. And it's funny because that's how I started translating Marosa di Giorgio. It was really almost 10 years ago in 2006. That's when I went. And it was recommended to me that I look into her work. I knew I wanted to do a translation project. And so, yeah, that's how I started with her. And 10 years later, I'm still working on her. So. I'm curious about translation itself, because I did a little of it. And then how, how hard, or tell us about the process of bringing something, especially something like poetry, from another language into English? Like, what's the, what are some of the challenges and some of the rewards? Well, you don't use Google Translate to translate <laughs> poetry. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's, um, I mean, I'd say, actually, I found it better when I first started translating because now I do use an online dictionary. I use wordreference.com to look up words that I don't know. And really, it was so much better when I didn't know about that or when it didn't exist. And I just used the physical dictionary and looked up the words that I didn't know. And I mean, even when I do know words, I look them up just because but just because, I don't know, you might see, reading the definition, you might see the word in a different way or come up with so many possibilities. I don't know, the challenges of translating, um, there's some quotation, I don't know who it's from, that I, that I saw somewhere, like the fact that translation is impossible has not prevented it from occasionally achieving greatness or something like that, because yeah, like translation is, in a sense, it is impossible. There are words in any language that are just not translatable. Um, and you do lose a lot in translation. So like there's one point in Di Giorgio, um, I forget, 
I forget where, somewhere in here, but she, she just has great sound elements. Um, like she says, she's, she's describing some image of this garden bursting into life, and she says something like, surge un hueso, un huevo, un hongo. You know, so un hueso, un huevo, un hongo. Like those, those words all have the similar sound, and if you translate that into English, it's a bone, an egg, a mushroom. So you totally lose, you totally lose that sound. But then other times you find things in translation. So it's kind of like a game of hide and seek, I guess. I don't know. It's really fun. I love it. Are any of the poems you translate rhymed in metrical? You know, not yet, but I'm thinking of starting. I actually, so this person is no one anyone knows, so I, I can say this. This is somebody in Toronto that I know who's a poet writing in Spanish. And she asked me to translate some of her work, and it was all rhyming. And it was very much like the roses are red, violets are blue school of poetry. It was all like, you know, you must love me. If you don't love me, I will die. Like it was really just total, totally like over the top and kind of just too sappy. And she was paying me to do this project. So, you know, I was trying to make it sound as good as possible in English using this Spanish material that I had. But I mean, of course, it was going to sound sappy in English because it sounded sappy in, in Spanish. But it ended up being just such a great chance to practice translating something that rhymed and like searching for rhymes in English and looking up an online rhyming dictionary and just complaining like I'm sure everyone complains that the only thing that rhymes with love is above <laughs> and, and shove. Love. Glove, yeah, you know, I'm so in love, we, we fit like a glove, right? Like, like, you know, like, it's just so, but it's just like any, <laughs> any, any, I know, it, it does not work, right? Like any, any church hymns, it's always like, you know, God's love sent from above, right? I mean, so that was really, really frustrating. But I think doing this project, translating this poetry for, for this friend of mine, um, and not all of her work was that bad, by the way, but <laughs> you know. Um, but like doing that, doing that work, I think definitely makes me want to try trans uh, translating some older poetry that's rhymed. Like really, in the Latin American world, most of what's being written now is free verse for the most part. But there's definitely like another Uruguayan poet from the early 20th century, and the only translations of her work are very academic ones. So. Yeah, you you had a question that too. That was gonna be my question. So, is there a difference between translating for uh, like a direct translation and translating poetically, and um, and translating poetically? Do you ever worry about like changing uh, an author's voice or? Yeah, you know that is a major ethical question. Like there are some people that do experimental translations where they purposely change things like crazy. Like there's a Canadian poet called Erin Moray who does that. And it's a question like how much is too much? How much license do you have as a translator with the author's work? And what does being faithful to the author's work mean, right? Because it doesn't mean being literal. It doesn't mean you know, using Google Translate and trying to put it down word for word. So. Another, um, another really well-known American translator who also works from Spanish to English, and she's actually been somewhat of a mentor for me. She edited this before it was published in 2010. She describes translation as the most intimate act of reading. And I really like that description because I think it's really, I mean, that's how I started translating. Like I was trying to read Spanish poetry as a freshman in college and finding I needed to look up words to understand it, and then finding I was looking up all the words and then translating it. So I think it's like really trying to get to know what, what the author is doing. So like when I first translated Di Giorgio, I was so stuck on translating the image, the images, that I didn't even really pay attention to her language and her syntax at all. And I made it this very kind of normalized sort of normal English syntax. And it was suggested to me to like, you know, no, like her, 
her Spanish syntax is weird. The English syntax should be weird too. So that's kind of, I don't know if that answers your question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, specific, specifically to Giorgio's work, did you feel like you needed to learn a lot of context about de Giorgio's life and Uruguay and the politics and her reality and her worldview? Or did you mostly just use what was on the page that she wrote as your, you know, did, you know, did all that context inform your translation? Yes, the context totally informed my translation. And I mean, that really, that really helped. Like ideally, if I'm translating, I'd like to meet the author. In her case, she was deceased. But I got to meet her family members, I got to meet her friends, and that was so special. You know, I felt like I was a detective looking for clues about her life, and it was really, really fun getting to do that. And I think definitely like knowing that she grew up on a farm, um, knowing that she had a difficult relationship with her mother, that she loved her mother very much, but never, um, you know, like she loved her very much, but they still had just had difficulties. Um, knowing that she never married, never had children, never had a relationship actually, except with this one friend who was like this, almost like this impossible love and some of her poems are addressed to him. Like all those biographical details definitely, I don't, like, I don't know how the translation would be different if I hadn't known all of that, but it definitely, you know, I like to know who I'm working with, and I'm just naturally a nosy person about people and want to know about them. So, yeah. Hi, yeah. Have you actually written any of your own poems in Spanish? A few, yeah. Not many, but a few. I mean, I prefer to write in English, like that's generally what comes, but there have been times like sometimes when I've been around a lot of Spanish speaking people, like when I w was in Uruguay and just hearing a lot of Spanish, then I would write a few in Spanish. But I don't have enough to make a booklet out of them or anything yet. But yeah, I do. Yeah. I actually have two questions. Sure. Um, one, uh, so you translated a couple of poets from, or going from Spanish to English. Um, how has it affected your poetry? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I really don't know. Like a lot of people, a lot of people say that like what I write in some sense resonates with Di Giorgio. And I think part of it is because, but I don't know what came first because I've been writing a long time, but I've been working on Di Giorgio a long time. And I don't know if it's just that, you know, I always was interested in things like nature and family and those kinds and spirituality and then it's like oh you know I found a poet that loves those topics and I love those topics but I think that um, like one teacher I had said that all poems are written on the back of other poems you know it's like we're always writing in response to what we read and I think that's so true like there's this myth of there's this myth of writing as this very solitary activity and you know the artist is this sort of romantic isolated figure and that's just that's not my experience like there is a certain amount of you know like you have to sit down yourself and write and edit but i mean all of all all writers are writing in response to other writers like even if you look at romanticism itself, British romanticism, like it was a community of writers, you know, writing in response to one another and in friendship with one another. So I think I'm definitely like we're all influenced by what we read, like all poets and teachers of poetry will tell you that you can't really write poetry without reading it. And like what you read will influence you. So, you know, I, um, I, <laughs> so, I mean, I think definitely, like, I've been influenced by Di Giorgio and a, a lot, and by others I've translated to, and by others I've read. Um, I was in this workshop in Toronto where we were reading all these poets that I never would have chosen to read on my own. So, I mean, that, that helps too, like being exposed to something that you wouldn't necessarily pick yourself. So, that was your first question, or? or? I mean, I've I've had I think I've had dreams in Spanish. Yeah, I think I I think so. 
but not because of, but I don't, I can't correlate them with any specific okay. thing. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've I've had I've had dreams in Spanish. Yeah. Anybody else? I know people are eager for cookies and fruit in the back. Thank you. Oh, let's give that to her. Thank you guys. Thank you for being here. I'm going to remind you that uh, Janine has books in the back. She doesn't have a lot of them, like we said, hot off the press, and she can haul too many from Toronto. They're so there are cover. a few that are there. And if you'd like to get one, she has a special student price of 10 bucks, which is a steal. Um, and you can sign up, and she'll bring them to you. And also, eat the food, hang out, ask your questions you didn't want to ask in public. <laughs> have a good night. Thank you so much Thank for coming. Thank you for being here. This was great to see all of you. Okay. Mm -hmm.